And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Dr. Eve Chavez. Dr. Chavez is a member of the Gabrielino Tongva San Gabriel Band of Mission Indians. After earning her PhD in art history from UCLA, she held a Mellon Fellowship at the Wheelwright Museum of the American Indian in Santa Fe, New Mexico. During the 2018-2019 academic year, she was a fellow at UC Santa Cruz through the UC President's Postdoctoral Fellowship Program. Really hard to get that fellowship, let me just say. Her current book project examines the artistic contributions of California's first peoples at the cutting at the missions and the survivance of California Indian material culture. Her work represents the cutting edge of new scholarship, this younger new generation uh, on the California missions. She is an assistant professor in the History of Art and Visual Culture Department at UC Santa Cruz. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Chavez back to UCLA. Her talk is entitled, An Indigenous Art History, New Approaches to Studying the California Missions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene, for inviting me to speak here today. And as Julia has done, I would like to also acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. It is an honor to be back at UCLA and in the home of my Tongva ancestors. My personal connection to the missions as a descendant of Mission San Gabriel's Tongva inhabitants inspires me to investigate the missions and push for greater understanding of native involvement in the shaping of these contested spaces. With that in mind, I would like to begin with a series of questions. What if we saw this instead of this when visiting the missions? What if all we saw were native houses like this one instead of adobe and stone buildings? How would that change our interpretation of the missions? I raise these questions to make us think about how architecture and art have shaped our understanding of the 21 California missions and the people who occupied them. The stone and adobe structures at the missions have captivated the attention of tourists, fourth graders, and scholars for generations even prompting mission restoration efforts beginning in the early 20th century. Given their similarity to architecture found in the Iberian Peninsula and parts of Mexico, the missions have long been associated with Spain. Moreover, the prevalence of imported art and liturgical items has inspired scholars with training in European art to study the mission's collections. While these studies have been crucial to understanding the mission's place in early modern exchange networks and Ibero-American history, they were also integral to the reshaping of the indigenous social order and visual culture. Though overshadowed by the monumental churches with their gilded retablos and life-size paintings, native architecture and portable artworks and visual culture were as much a part of the mission's aesthetic landscape. Often reconstructions, the churches we see at the missions today are deceiving. When the Franciscans first established each mission, they conducted services in temporary Ramada-like structures made from native plants like tule and willow, built by native hands these early chapels bore little resemblance to the towering basilicas the Franciscans were used to seeing in Spain. In time, the Franciscans charged the neophytes with building permanent structures out of lumber from California's forests, whitewash paint ground from Pacific Coast seashells, and adobe shaped from a mixture of native plants and earth. Though heavily restored, these churches have become emblems of the missions and the Spanish presence in colonial California. Without a doubt, Spain certainly left its mark on California, 
but the narrative of its hegemonic relationship with Native Americans has unfairly placed the latter group at a disadvantage. Despite incredible obstacles, California Indians survived, as did their visual culture. If California's first peoples were central to the construction and decoration of the missions, why do their efforts remain understudied? I pondered this question when I set out to study the artistic and architectural contributions of California's first peoples at the Franciscan missions. Aside from limited studies on artworks attributed to native artists, little has been written about the role indigenous peoples played in shaping the visual landscape of these sites. More importantly, indigenous agency remains severely under theorized and understood. Today, my goal is to outline new approaches to investigating the art and architecture of the missions that place these historic sites within the framework of indigenous and California Indian studies. Controlled by non-native scholars since the early 20th century, the study of California Indian culture has finally reached a moment where California Indian scholars are reclaiming the narrative. As part of this shift, I strive to resituate the missions as one piece of California's historical trajectory rather than the beginning. First, I discuss how a study of mission art and architecture fits within California Indian studies. Then I trace the challenges to writing an indigenous art history of the missions. I end by proposing a methodology that evaluates California's indigenous visual culture and art on its own terms. Long overshadowed by studies of Western influence, I argue that the missions embody the indigenous knowledge that existed well before Spanish colonization and which remains part of our communities today. To begin that discussion, I invite you to reflect on why we are here today. In December of 2018, the University of California Office of the President announced the funding of critical mission studies at California's crossroads to support, quote, research to create a new multi-dimensional narrative of California history that includes the voices and perspectives of not only California settlers, but also the Native American and Mexican American communities that helped lay the foundation for the state's development. I push this statement a step further by calling for Native Californian voices to occupy the forefront of California's historical narrative. In recent years, Native American and indigenous studies have called for the decolonization of our histories and spaces. Yet this term remains fraught with debates about what it means to truly decolonize. Following Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang's definition, a decolonized California would be repatriated to the descendants of its original inhabitants. This is an unlikely scenario in a place where our village identities are rarely seen under layers of colonist and Catholic saint names. Rather than erasing California's colonial presence, I look to the built environment and material record for signs of indigenous survivance. To do so, I return to the this photograph I showed earlier of a scaled down model of a Tongva house, known in our language as a quiche. When, Tongva, when Spanish explorers sailed along California's coast in the 16th century, they saw hemispherical houses that could house 12 to 13 individuals, consisting of a willow frame covered with tule or fern these structures look like baskets turned upside down. The same plant knowledge that went into making conical houses also applied to the baskets that coastal Southern California's first peoples wove to gather, store, and cook food. Though used less frequently than in the past, 
California Indians continue to weave baskets out of native plants such as juncus, sumac, deer grass, and redbud. In addition to making baskets for everyday purposes, weavers made baskets to present as gifts. When the Spanish colonists arrived, they commented in their letters and journals that they received food and other items in baskets from coastal communities. Taking these accounts with a grain of salt, we might consider the possibility that the foreigners took baskets and other native belongings without asking. In the 16th and 17th centuries, European explorers took an interest in collecting materials from cultures they considered exotic. They took these materials back to Europe where they were displayed in cabinets of curiosities within the homes of the elite. Eventually, these collections provided the foundation for ethnographic museums. This trend continued through the 19th century when members of the Vancouver expedition took baskets, including this one, ritual paraphernalia, and tools from coastal Southern California back to England, where they are now housed in the British Museum. Believed to have been made at one of the missions within the Chumash region, this basket hat signals the ingenuity of weavers who experimented with new shapes and patterns. Whereas weavers who lived outside the missions had the flexibility to collect basket plants and weave when and where they wanted, weavers in the missions found themselves expected to take on new tasks, which limited their time to make baskets. Women did laundry for the native community as well as the priests. They harvested crops and cooked meals, in addition to attending mass and raising families. Meanwhile, men built mission structures, worked as blacksmiths, tanners, and soap makers. Yet a handful of individuals also continued to carry out pre-contact practices. Female weavers at Mission San Buenaventura made baskets for government figures and leaders in the Catholic Church. Their baskets with heraldic designs are amongst some of the most well-known examples from the Mission era. While these have gained attention within Mission scholarship, it is clear that weavers also made baskets without foreign patterns, which can be seen in some of the examples displayed at the mission museums. We know, for instance, that friars at Mission San Buenaventura encouraged weavers to make coiled baskets. However, it appears this was not the case at all the missions. Though I would not credit the friars with the survival of basket weaving, the opportunity they presented for weavers to weave in the missions enabled some communities to sustain their practice. Future investigations are needed to determine why weaving and other indigenous practices that predated the missions and Spanish colonization remain more prevalent within certain communities over others. In a separate study of basket weaving in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, I discussed the role the curio trade played in the resurgence of weaving in Southern California and its decline in the mid 20th century. For instance, in the 1880s and 90s, non-native collectors took an interest in collecting Native American baskets. This collecting trend that was popularized by the arts and crafts movement contributed to the removal of baskets from indigenous communities, which often ended up, again, in museum collections. In response to this growing interest, weavers began to make them for sale to collectors and tourists from around 1890 through the 1920s. Like their ancestors who lived at the missions and made baskets for explorers and political leaders, these later weavers made baskets that appealed to collectors' interests. Enterprising individuals like Pennsylvania transplant Grace Nicholson sold these baskets from her curio shop in Pasadena beginning in 1902. And you can see how cluttered that shop was. 
She sought out the best basketry produced in California, which she then sold to wealthy non-native collectors, including the museum now known as the Phoebe Hearst Museum of Anthropology at UC Berkeley. The basket craze aided a handful of weavers in supporting their families in the early 20th century, but it proved unsustainable as lifestyles shifted. From the 1920s to the 1970s, basket weaving underwent a period of decline as native peoples further assimilated into Anglo-American society. The Second World War and the boarding school system, amongst other societal changes, disrupted community connections for native peoples and pulled them further away from their traditions. Though basket weaving fell out of common practice amongst many of Southern California's native communities in the mid 20th century, weaving knowledge survived. Concerned community members and allies pursued re revitalization efforts in the 1980s with the passing of the older generation of weavers. Native communities are reviving basket weaving today and contemporary baskets can be found in museums. But that does not change the fact that many of our ancestors' baskets have been lost or removed from our communities. As mentioned, examples of California Indian material and visual culture can be found in international museum collections as a result of early modern global exchanges and collecting expeditions. Native peoples living within and outside the missions traded with foreigners but their involvement has been sidelined in historical narratives. California Indians were active participants in these exchanges, but their side of the story is rarely told. As part of the larger study of California Indian material and visual culture, I propose we look at the missions as spaces where cultural practitioners navigated complex social networks to maintain but also rework existing practices. Doing so, however, comes with its own set of challenges. Before the 20th century, most accounts of California Indian material and visual culture were told from a non-native perspective. The first known indigenous account of California's native people did not appear until the 1830s when Luiseno scholar Pablo Toc was studying for the priesthood while in Rome. In his notes, Toc described the indigenous dances and language that he knew while growing up at Mission San Luis Rey de Francia, where he was born in 1822. Then in the 1870s, a team of researchers interviewed California Indian elders, including Lorenzo Asisara of the Ohlone commun community and Luis Enio Ahashiman informant Julio Cesar for historian Hubert Howe Bancroft's publications on the history of California. Also in the late 19th century, anthropologist J.P. Harrington interviewed Chumash elders, such as Maria Solares, Fernanda Librado, Lucrecia Garcia, and others, including Tongva informants such as Juan Melendrez and Jose de los Santos Juncos, amongst many other California natives. Harrington's notes from his discussions with Librado provide the richest explanation of Chumash artistic customs. Librado was born sometime between 1804 and 1820 on Santa Cruz Island and lived until 1915, which meant he saw nearly a century of the changes Chumash culture underwent. During his childhood, he lived in Ventura and spent time at both Mission San Buenaventura and Santa Barbara. He shared his memories of life at these missions in an interview that Harrington conducted between 1912 and 1915. Librado also confirmed the names of the Chumash artists who worked at Mission Santa Barbara in the early 19th century. Unfortunately, though, this has not been the case for artists associated with other missions. 
tainted by Eurocentric biases, early descriptions typically dismiss the cultural and linguistic diversity of California's indigenous populations. Moreover, non-native authors left out the names of individuals they met, which makes it difficult to identify the makers of art and other belongings made during the mission era. Though we may not be able to uncover the names of these ancestors, their stories and memories are embodied in their belongings. Unfortunately, many of those stories remain untold because the belongings are inaccessible to the living community who cannot easily travel overseas to visit international collections. Even in the age of the internet, some museum collections remain undigitized, which makes it difficult to know what is in them. Or provenance records remain incomplete due to poor cataloging or lack of knowledge on the part of museum staff. In some cases, museums have even misidentified California Indian materials, as Travis Hudson and Craig Bates found when they studied international collections acquired during Russian expeditions. So what can we do to minimize or overcome these obstacles? Museums need to make their collections known and accessible. Native communities also need to, they need support to send members to look at these belongings in person. Viewing them in a photograph is definitely not the same. By visiting collections, community members can provide museum staff with guidance on how to properly care for belongings and respect the memories of our ancestors. In some cases, living descendants may even be able to identify their ancestors' work, or at least the culture of origin, thereby allowing a museum to update its records and properly inform future visitors and researchers. Collection visits also present an opportunity for our leaders to bless the collections. Meanwhile, repatriation would allow some communities to take the ancestors home. Unfortunately, this is a rare occurrence amongst international museums that are not bound by the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Even so, it would be appropriate for an institution to work with the community to provide proper context. Keeping in mind that the historical materials in museums today typically were not made to be sold, were typically made to not be in museums, how can these institutions and the scholars who write about their belongings inside them, inside the museums, educate others? When studying these materials, we should think about the context in which they were extracted. Where were they made? In villages or in the missions? The missions represent one fragment of California's history as well as the social landscape. In his research on the Coast Miwok of the Marin Peninsula, archaeologist Sim Schneider calls for a reading of the places and landscapes around sites of contact and colonialism. Following his example, we ought to consider the activities that occurred outside the missions, pueblos and presidios. For instance, archaeologists have uncovered evidence of shell bead production in the hinterlands where native communities lived outside the missions. We also know that the Franciscans allowed some mission inhabitants to visit their homelands on furloughs. These opportunities would have enabled them to gather materials for basket weaving and regalia making, amongst other activities. Individuals who never lived in the missions also would have continued these practices after colonization. However, because their contact with colonists was infrequent, the material and visual culture of the latter group received less attention in the written record. Early 20th century literature also facilitated a biased narrative that placed the missions at the center of California history. Coined in the 1940s by journalist Carrie McWilliams, 
The concept of a Spanish fantasy heritage referred to the propaganda that drew tourists to California in search of a romanticized Spanish past. Helen Hunt Jackson's fictional novel, Ramona, about a half native, half Scottish woman, helped to spur interest in California and its native peoples. With its unrealistic description of bucolic landscapes and Spanish chivalry, Ramona inspired tourists from the Eastern United States to travel west on the transcontinental railroad. Though she never existed, tourists hoped they would find Ramona's birthplace in Southern California. Curio dealers like those previously mentioned jumped on this opportunity to make basket, to sell baskets made by women who they conflated with the fictional character at the center of Jackson's novel. For instance, collectors sought out baskets by mountain Kauia weaver Ramona Lubo for their fine craftsmanship and her perceived association with the fictional character. These collectors were not only driven by fascination with California's Spanish past, but also a fear that Native Americans were dying off. While the sale of baskets provided weavers with a source of income, the early 20th century collecting craze did not change the fact that California's ind indigenous population had already significantly diminished. As the 20th century began, California's indigenous populations had endured forced religious conversion and assimilation, as well as drastic population decline. Before 1769, the California Indian population was about 310,000. By 1845, the population had fallen to roughly 150,000. Surviving California Indians adopted new identities, including those imposed by colonial powers. The Tongva and other converts at Mission San Gabriel became known as Gabrielinos, the Mission San Juan Capistrano inhabitants as Juaneños, and so forth. You get the idea. The federal government pushed this naming system further by lumping together Southern California's diverse populations into one group called the Mission Indians. By associating Native peoples, even those who never lived at the missions with these institutions, early 20th century mission enthusiasts set in motion a long-lasting fascination with California's Spanish past. Mission museums have catered to this fascination by creating exhibits that glorify the Franciscan missionaries while dismissing the truth of the indigenous experience. To this day, the California fourth grade curriculum teaches school children an unrealistic narrative about California history and the missions that minimizes the oppression of indigenous peoples. Fourth graders even continue to make projects modeled after the 21 missions. In 2017, the California state legislature passed Assembly Bill 738 which, quote, would require the Instructional Quality Commission to develop and the State Board to adopt, modify, or revise a model curriculum in Native American studies and would encourage each school district and charter school that maintains any of grades 9 to 12 inclusive that does not otherwise offer a standards-based Native American Studies curriculum to offer a course of study in Native American Studies based on the model curriculum, end quote. Though promising for high school age students, the bill does not apply to fourth grade when students are indoctrinated with a romanticized image of the past. This image has been the inspiration for some scholars to pursue research on the California missions in their adulthood. Anyone is welcome to take an interest in California and the missions, but I caution against perpetuating narratives that are harmful to the indigenous communities. This conference comes at a critical moment as native and non-native scholars are shifting the narrative to place the indigenous experience at the center of California history studies. The title itself calls upon us to question the parameters of American art 
from which native art, particularly the art of California and the missions, is often excluded. Located on the periphery of the Viceroyalty of New Spain, Mexico, and later the United States, California occupies a unique position within the fields of Latin American and American art. Colonized within the last 60 years of Bourbon control, California was one of the last areas in North America to feel the impacts of the Spanish conquest. Scholars of colonial Mexico, including some of you in the audience, have examined the missions in connection to the rest of northern New Spain. California's missions received European art and furnishings by way of the Baja California missions and other parts of Mexico, as well as vestments and liturgical instruments from Asia through the Manila galleon trade. The latter group of imports presents an area for much needed exploration, which Joanne Mancini has pioneered. Knowledge of early modern economics and politics is essential to the study of California's place in Spain's Pacific trade networks. Meanwhile, a background in Asian art and materiality is key to discussing trends in the global art market and Catholic influences on non-Western cultures. This skill set comes from the interdisciplinary training that graduate programs only more recently began promoting. Likewise, the study of indigenous art and the missions also calls for a diverse skill set rooted in knowledge of Spanish colonial history and indigenous material culture. Oops. I think I hit the wrong thing. Okay. The study of indigenous agency is not new to the field of colonial Latin American art which has a contested history of applying alternative terms such as hybrid, syncretic, tikitki, mestizo, and Indo-Christian to artworks that reflect the intersection of indigenous and European ideas and materials. Charlene Villasenor Black has called for a shift away from using these words to describe colonial period art. Using race-based terms, she argues, is antiquated, prejudicial, and patronizing. Doing so also minimizes the accommodations Native peoples have made for foreign ideas in colonial exchanges. Thus, using terms like hybrid would deny the values and ideologies embedded within the art and visual culture of California's first peoples within and beyond the missions. California Indian art and visual culture existed before European colonization, so it would not make sense to call it by a new name, especially one that privileges an outdated conception of European progress. Hybridity also implies that non-Western art, or in this case, native art, improved through contact with European art. In my own work, I treat indigenous made art and visual culture from the mission era as the continuation of pre-existing traditions. I also use both the terms art and visual culture to acknowledge, as previously mentioned, that not everything from the missions was made as art in the Western sense of the term. We may never know which terms late 18th and early 19th century California Indian artists used to describe their work, yet late 19th century native accounts provide some insights regarding the terms ancestors used to name objects and ceremonies. Ethnographic studies can thus help situate California Indian artistic practices within an indigenous framework. California Indian artists were not simply bowing to the commands of mission leaders. They actively subverted an oppressive power structure by making regalia, baskets, sculptures, domestic and sacred structures that embodied ancestral community-based knowledge. Colonists attempted to acculturate and control the indigenous peoples of the Americas, but our ancestors persisted. By 1846, when the United States invaded California and effectively took it from Mexico, 
California's first peoples had spent 77 years resisting Spanish, Mexican, and Russian policies. This does not even include the centuries of Spanish colonization felt throughout Mexico. Like their neighbors to the south, California Indians decolonized sites of contact, mainly the missions, by performing traditional practices within these contested spaces. Native peoples comprised much of the population at each mission, and they constructed and decorated most of the buildings. Indigenous laborers built edifices using local materials, often within the boundaries of pre-existing Aboriginal villages. Before the Spanish invasion, California Indians relied upon environmental markers such as mountains and water to designate space. Place was not just defined by where people slept at night, but also the physical landscape they inhabited. When the Spaniards arrived in California and other parts of the Americas, they asserted that American Indian land was available for them to claim as their own. Unlike Europeans who decimated natural resources with the introduction of foreign species and for material resource extraction, California Indians engaged in land management activities such as controlled burns that stimulated new growth and resources. The groves of trees and fields of wildflowers that colonists saw were the product of California Indian stewardship, not just unattended land. California Indians reacted by continuing to make baskets, sculpture, shell beads, and regalia in their villages and at the missions. They also led revolts, ran away, refused to work, and sought leadership roles, all while suffering from disease and starvation. It is time that we honor the ancestors by telling the truth about their history and evaluate California Indian art and visual and material culture within the context of the knowledge they passed down to us. Earlier, I questioned the parameters of American art. Rather than trying to make native art fit within this category, perhaps we should think about how colonial concepts continue to shape our perception of indigenous cultures. The borders that separate the state of California from other US states and the Mexican state of Baja California should no longer confine our understanding of the peoples that originally occupied these spaces. I would like to end with this view of the Pacific Ocean as a reminder that borders may cross our lands, but the water is something that walls cannot contain. This conference signals a historic moment as voices from both sides of the US-Mexico border come together to break down these colonial barriers. Together, we all have a responsibility to place native perspectives at the forefront of the mission narrative. And I look forward to working with you. Thank you. There. Okay. <laughs> like, so we're going to um, open up Q&A and discussion with uh, Professor Chavez. Uh, and I believe we have two microphones out in the audience. Yes, <laughs> they're coming. So if you'd like to say something, just raise your hand and we'll run uh, a microphone over to you so that everyone can uh, hear. Are we, are we? Yes, thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Thank you, Eve, for that wonderful presentation. Um, this is probably something you've been asked a lot, or certainly have thought about a lot, but what would your ideal fourth grade curriculum be? Or uh, how, how would we change this? Would they be still making models? I mean, uh, what would your idea be? Well, I think there are several people in the audience who can speak to that question as well. Um, I think one, priority for me is that the local tribes have a say in how their histories are taught instead of having a 
generalized history for all of California because the statewide there's, history. Yeah. There's so many of our groups that have unique experiences and we're still alive. So the living yeah. perspective needs to be part of that curriculum, certainly. Um, I and don't know the, if on Jonathan a school board by Stan. school board basis because it's it's very localized or how that's to to make the curriculum happen. Well, there would probably need to be some sort of framework, but yeah. the educators, fourth grade teachers, need to be made known who the local leaders are, who can speak and educate them about what is a priority in telling those stories. And I, I know Governor Newsom has already started to invite Native community members to, or his wife actually, um, oh. has had that conversation. Um, but it's With school kids or with? With the Native representatives. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it's a, a long road, I would say. It's not something that will happen overnight and the sugar cube projects need to go away. That is, yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's just one fragment of California's history, as I mentioned, and there's so much more to who we are than these institutions. And a lot of people didn't even live in the mission, so it doesn't make sense to have that be the one point of reference for children to learn about Native peoples. That was one of your most interesting points, the way that it was the whole landscape and that there were these uh, rotating uh, movements. And, and it's a much bigger area. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. I think that your talk was wonderful. And I was wondering whether Indian indigenous voices are incorporated in the interpretation of the sites because I, I work on that area, uh, especially in archaeological sites, and we are trying to incorporate indigenous voices on the interpretation of the sites. And I don't know what is the situation right here. It is lacking. I, I think it varies from one mission to the next. There are 21 in California. Two are run by the state park system. And the mission that my family is associated with, Mission San Gabriel, has worked with Julia to update some of our narrative in the museum. But I don't know that we've even updated the labels yet. It, it's the museum is run by volunteers and we have limited time to give to make those changes and I don't know about the other missions I think it's a pretty minimal involvement on the part of native people not by their choice but often because the diocese in which those missions are located often are not very warm towards Native people, especially not Native scholars, because they want to maintain this, again, romanticized narrative that Junipero Serra was this wonderful person, and they don't want to bring in some Native person that they think could radicalize their, their story that maintains this image that the missions were good places. Okay, thank you. Joanne has a question. Thanks very much, Eve, um, for that. <laughs> when I saw your slides from the, the vaults in the British Museum, I was sort of having flashbacks, you know, from, from <laughs> when we were there. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, actually, because it hadn't occurred to me, the fact that um, outside of the United States that um, other nations are not legally held to to Nagra, and that and the implications of that in terms of what the obligations of collections like the British Museum or the Musée um, du Cap and, and other other institutions. And so I was wondering if you could um, give us some further thoughts on that, and to ask you whether um, you think that there's anything that say the state of California or the University of California could do to, I suppose, progress um, the, the, the conversation with international um, collections mm -hmm. in terms of what their 
obligations are and how they could make their collections more accessible and do all the things that you know ideally um, could be done, both in terms of of repatriation, but also in terms of education, in terms of accessibility, in terms of having these these conversations. Um, so, any any thoughts that you have on that? I'd really be interested in hearing. Well, the University of California could probably change what they've been doing since the Phoebe Hearst Museum at Berkeley and the Fowler are the two main museums that have collections. I, my understanding is that they still have a ways to go in having conversations with our communities. And I don't know that any have repatriated materials. Part of the problem is that a lot of the tribes associated with the missions are not federally recognized, and that creates an obstacle for NAGPRA because if there isn't a federally recognized tribe without money to build a museum itself, then muse the non-native museums are less inclined to return materials if there is no home that they feel comfortable sending them to. But I think this Critical Mission Studies grant is a great opportunity to have a conversation within the UC system about how we can turn those institutions into models for international museums to follow. I don't, I don't know, it's a complex question and maybe other people in the audience want to say something. Helen? Hi. Okay. Uh, there were also some communities who actually give. Oh, thank you. Hello. Uh, actually, have sacred items in their in their uh, within their families, and they uh, need a place to store them to conserve them. And they have been working with museums to do that. And so it's like a really interesting collaboration going on. But it, mm. it's something that I learned at a at a talk like this at LACMA uh, recently. So, so there are some communities who do that, yeah. but then going back to the problem of the fourth grade curriculum, because I just was invited to teach about Mesoamerica and how to teach it in, in, uh, from the Latin American Institute here at UCLA. Um, oh, it works if I use it. Um, and I think that one of the things we have to do if we really want to change the curriculum, we just have to do it. We have to stop presenting it the way that you're talking about. As, as a, something glorified. In fact, I'm teaching, some of my students are here. Uh, we're learning about the missions right now and we're talking about how to represent them in a different light. So I think if we really want to do the change, uh, we just have to start teaching children how exactly was the experience at, at, the, at the basic level. And some people, when, when something new happens, people have a tendency to say, oh, they're too young to understand this genocide or this. I had a very powerful experience one time. When, with a, when I was in grad school, I met a person who, was, who is Armenian and told me that the Armenian genocide must be taught early on in kindergarten. And I, I naively said, aren't they too young to understand genocide? And she said, we teach them about the German Holocaust. And I say, touche, absolutely. Hello, uh, you know, little children can learn, in and it must be taught at kindergarten. I think when we get them in college, it's too late to really change that perception. It has to be taught in kindergarten. And then in first grade, second grade, and they understand what this land is and how rich all the different tribes are. And the problem is not easy at all. Thank, congratulations, by the way. I applaud the, 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 the grant and everything. I love what you're doing. Uh, and it must be done. And it can be done, but we just have to know that it's difficult. We cannot settle the score right at this point. Uh, but we can, we can do many changes in the curriculum for sure. I just wanted to say that um, as a kumiai from San Diego, our people are in both San Diego and Baja California, Mexico. And um, when you're talking about the mission, I have a son that's a fourth grader this year. 
and we're going to make the mission. But what happened on uh, November 5th, 1775, hundreds of Kumeyaay warriors attacked that mission and turned Father Jaime into a grease spot. <laughs> we burned down the missions that were in our territory. And that's what, if they're going to be teaching that, we're going to teach the whole story. We're going to say the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And as far as like, you know, uh, protection of sacred sites, I know with NAGPRA and, you know, you know some of the struggles that are going on, uh, you know, with federally and non-federally recognized tribes, the Kumeyaay tribe, for the most part, there's 13 federally recognized tribes in San Diego. But half of our people are in Baja, California, Mexico. And this is where protection of sacred sites can be uh, problematic at times. Uh, now, um, there's representatives here and looking forward to, you know, the dialogue that, that's coming with that. But yes, to, you know, to, to protect our, site, uh, our sites is very important. Uh, one example is, how many of you ever had a Tecate beer? How many of you ever seen Tecate? You know that mountain that's on that uh, can is our sacred mountain, Kuchama, the old man who sleeps. Tecate is a Kumya word. It's Tecate, the old man who chops wood. So these are things that have been appropriated and used by other people. And these are things that, 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 that need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the United States, it's, it's international. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I uh, thank you very much for the talk, very, very great talk. I, I was curious about your proposal of digitizing the objects and collections that are sort of elided and hidden away. Um, in, in sort of uh, echoing the comments about the mountain of Tecate, Tecat, uh, some of these objects were not necessarily meant to be seen right. or meant to be shared, yeah. uh, practices and, and, and so forth. So uh, how, uh, how do we deal with that problem of not only getting uh, a virtual access, but also the commensurate knowledge of how to engage with these objects that mm -hmm. ha bring with them their own sort of power? Well, I don't know that I have the answer. <laughs> I think it's more of a rhetorical question, yeah. but I wanted to put that out there, yeah. that, that a lot of these, a, a lot of objects are, are not meant necessarily for uh, casual consumption, right? right? They're, not, they're not designed in, in such a way that we think of material culture now. We, we seem to have, you know, our phones and all of this other stuff to have access uh, and dominance domain over the material and visual. But this is not necessarily the way that uh, many communities sort of operate. Right, so. yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. I just wanted to make a little point of clarification um, regarding um, the UC system and the repatriation of ancestors. Because here at UCLA, we have a wonderful colleague in a Fowler Museum, Wendy Teeter, who is the curator and NAGPRA officer. And it's my understanding that 98% of the ancestors in that collection um, I actually, I shouldn't use the word collection, but 98% of the ancestors have been repatriated. And I don't think it's been an easy process. I think it's been fraught um, with a lot of work with UCLA over the years. But definitely um, the idea that UCA, UCLA and UC systems should be a model um, is absolutely something that I hope is discussed more for sure. Thank you. Sorry, I just wanted to add something. Um, I've been working with indigenous communities in archaeological sites, and to my knowledge, in, in, in several parts of, of, of Central America. 
And my experience is that um, every single community has a different view about access to the collections. And sometimes it can be about the object in itself, and sometimes they are happy to show a photograph, or they are happy to show the knowledge that is in the object. So there is no straight answer. I think that is something that it has to be consulted. Mm -hmm. And it's the same regarding the sites. Sometimes there are communities that actually don't want people to go to the sacred sites, and they want to just actually prohibit. And sometimes there are communities that, that want people, but in certain terms. So for that reason, I think that it's really not possible to have a receipt. It's something that it has to be consulted for each case. And uh, regarding the, the Basque I was really interested about the, all the, the Basque industry because I was wondering whether there are still artisans that are working in uh, uh, yeah, these uh, baskets or whatever because the technology be behind these artifacts is key to understand them and also to um, recover indigenous knowledge. And I think that is also another line of research that perhaps it's very helpful to pursue in the future. So there are communities that either continuously have been weaving. Stan's community, I believe, is one. And there are others like our tribe that have had to look at historical baskets to relearn the process of weaving and also to work with other communities who worked in a similar manner to learn the technology of making baskets. Other questions? Okay. I'd, I'd just like to, well, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It's very thought provoking and it's, um, it's a subject that's much broader. Uh, the whole um, museum world, <laughs> in the world, <laughs> I mean museums, uh, collections are full of objects that theoretically, one might say, should be returned. And this has, uh, th these are discussions that go on. Or um, the, the, we're talking here about a past that's not so distant mm -hmm. and that there are people of the communities that are, that are actually in, in, interested in they are, this is a demand that they have or at least a desire that they have and that obviously has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I, I, this is just a, a general statement I'm gonna make, I mean, um, you know, Italians always say, oh, why is that painting in the Louvre? Well, it's in the Louvre because that happened in the, you know, 16th century. And one could say, well, we want it back. But um, there are, in other words, there are historical situations that are different, that are more complex. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, a very, it's a very good discussion to have. But um, I think we also have to think in broad, broad terms about what sorts of institutions we, we want in the future for um, artworks. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so, um, <laughs> okay. um, so the other question is actually a question. Uh, and with a brief setup, um, I'm fact, and thank you for being here. Um, and I teach in the English, English and Chicano studies, and I teach an early Chicano lit survey. So we go Aztecs through the Mexican Revolution. Uh, and it, one of the challenges I face in that class with my students is to try to get them to think about how, you know, yes, we're learning about how Anglo Americans came and stole all this land from Mexicans, but Mexicans came and stole all this land from indigenous people. So in that class I teach already, I teach Tak, I teach Asisara, and I teach Cesar. Um, but my question to you is, who else could I teach? Or um, where can I go to uh, look for more interesting material that might illuminate that story? 
about California? About California in particular, and like how the um, how indigenous and Mexican communities are relating to each other even before the advent of of, of the American army. So like early nineteenth century, it's because. You know, like you were saying earlier, one of the difficulties you face is that um, scholarship on indigenous California is produced by non-indigenous scholars. So similarly, there's lots of literature about uh, native Californians, but it's produced by Mexicans or Anglo settlers. So talk is great, because um, he's not either of those things. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I know I'm sort of asking you to do my job, but um, maybe point me, point me in the direction of where I could go to look for more material like that. Well, primary sources are limited. Um, just the fact that we're here today, there are some of us who are native, who are bringing our perspective as the living descendants of native people who were impacted directly by the missions and colonization who are writing our our version the truth of uh, california history so you will be hearing th those voices throughout the conference and many of us have published and i would recommend anything that we have written and to continue to watch for what we are going to publish down the road. So um, there's not a, a large body of literature just yet, but it's emerging. Any other yes. thoughts on that? Yeah, I have one question only. Um, in general, we have a very nationalistic view also of what Mexicans are, but actually, if we look at Mexicans nowadays in California, you have many indigenous people from Mexico. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if there's any record of the missionaries when they came here, what's the, what was the indigenous component from central Mexico mm -hmm. in the missions mm -hmm. themselves? Because we, cannot we shouldn't be reproducing this romantic vision mm -hmm. of the missions as a Spanish thing. It was not, mm -hmm. not anymore. Well, there are also new publications coming out that look at that relationship between indigenous peoples coming from Mexico and interacting with native peoples here and the results of their intermarriage. That's not a, an area that I specialize in. There are probably other scholars in this room who can say more about that history. But there certainly should be more interest in that topic and to help break down those barriers about um, the missions being just Spanish institutions. OK, one more question. Thank you for patiently answering all of our many questions. And thank you for your talk. Um, I guess more than a question, I wanted to just extend an invitation um, you know, in light of the work you mentioned also, you know, about facilitating access and decolonizing museum spaces and collections as well. I mean, um, so I work on the history of the British Empire in the 18th and 19th centuries, and the British Museum, of course, is a, is a thorn in my side as well. Um, and I think as scholars, we all have to navigate, you know, how to bring in a critical perspective to these collections, knowing that we also have to maintain relations with these collections in order to have those points of access. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted to, I, I wanted to bring this up because I think a lot of the questions you're raising, um, you know, methodologically about, you know, indigenous studies, visual culture, aesthetics, are ones that certainly, you know, resonate in many ways with the questions that I also experience in a different framework and geographical domain working on colonial contact between Britain and South Asia. So for example, for many years, the history of South Asian painting from the 18th century onwards was seen as the moment in which naturalism is introduced by Europeans. You know, perspective, literally, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I only, I, I, the, the invitation I want to extend is that, you know, in working with collections such as the British Museum, which remain these kind of collection, history of the world sites, even with Neil McGregor's History of the World and 100 Objects book and podcast, there's still a way in which I think, you know, his, histories of colonialism take a dominant lens still of this is how we can understand 
comparatively. Mm -hmm. And I do think that there could be something productive also for those of us who are working to, you know, do some, some you know, do like to bring in different voices and, you know, take, you know, intervene in those histories, but to also learn to talk to each other. Because I think often we'll say, yes, for example, you know, sort of bullion trade, what is Asian material culture, but we're not necessarily talking at the level of what our um, interventions in terms of working within those collecting practices today are. So this is just a note to say, I hope there will be more conversations between our respective fields as well. Yes, thank you. Okay. OK. So let's please thank her and for an amazing talk and for everyone's great questions. We're going to take a 10-minute break and rearrange the stage a little bit and then start uh, panel one. But thank you so much, Eve, for that wonderful talk.